This video will talk about some of the assumptions and the significance in ANOVA. So some of the assumptions is that we have I independent random samples, one from each population. We measure the same response variable for each sample. The second assumption is that the ith population has a normal distribution with some unknown mean, which will denote mu sub i. The third assumption is that all the populations have the same standard deviation sigma, but we don't necessarily know what that is. So this goes back to why we might pool the standard deviations together. So these conditions are really important to understand as we think about doing analysis of variance. Now we saw this in simple linear regression, but in analysis of variance, you can analyze the variance. And so that's what this slide is showing. We can think about our total sums of squares, which will denote TSS, and that's each value X minus the mean squared. And we sum that up for all of the points in our data. We can then think about the sum of squares between groups. And so this is where we take within each uh, or between each group, each value n in that treatment, the mean from that treatment minus the grand mean, or the mean from the entire data set, and we square that. And that could represent differences between the different groups, because this is the mean for the ith treatment, and this is the mean for all of the data. Then we have the sums of squares within groups. So you can think about this as the variability within one treatment. And so here it's the number of observations in that treatment i minus 1 multiplied by the variance. And so in this case we can think that large values of the sums of squares between groups reflect large differences in the treatment means. If we have small values of the sums of squares between groups, we don't likely have any differences across the different treatment means. And so this is a handy way of thinking about how we might partition the variability or analyze the variability uh, in our analysis of variance. Now this is the ANOVA table uh, that kind of helps keep everything organized. Uh, so we have three sources. We have the regression, the residual, and the total. We have a certain number of degrees of freedom. And so here you can think about P being uh, the number of treatments minus 1. And so the previous notation we said i, i was the number of treatments, so p could be i minus 1. And so in this case uh, the residual would be n minus p minus 1, and then the total degrees of freedom would be n minus 1. Again we have regression sums of squares, residual sums of squares, and we can add them up to get the total sum of squares. We can cal calculate the mean square for the regression, the mean square for the residuals, by taking the sums of squares and dividing them by the degrees of freedom. And then our value, our important value that will denote significance, is the f value. And so for that, we take the regression mean square and divide it by the residual mean square. This is very similar to what we did with simple linear regression. That's why I like this ANOVA table, because it organizes everything in our analysis of variance. Now a way to visualize that and to visualize how the different hypotheses are working is to look at something like this. So remember our null hypothesis in the analysis of variance assumes that all samples are drawn from the same population or that mu sub 1 equals mu 2 equals mu 3. Our alternative hypothesis says that at least one of the differences uh, you'll observe for each of the means. And so in this case, we might think that mu1, mu2, and mu3 are all different. Um, so the alternative hypothesis is that at least one of them is drawn from a different population. And so here are some outcomes. Here's a likely decision where we would not reject the null hypothesis. You can see that across these three different samples, there are some differences, but they look minor. And so we might think that we do not have evidence to reject the null. And so there's really no difference between the means. Now we can compare that to a second case where it looks like we have large differences 
across the sample means. In this case, we might reject the null hypothesis. We have evidence to say through our analysis that these population means are different. So to determine statistic, uh, or to determine significance, we can look at the test statistic. And remember, this is the value that's in that last cell in the ANOVA table, the mean square between groups divided by the mean square within groups. And so then we can reject the null hypothesis if our test statistic ends up being greater than the critical value from the F table. And so that critical value from the F table, we could look up manually, or if we're looking at it in R, we could look at something like the p-value and compare that to our uh, level of significance for our, for our test. If the different values of n are different, that is, you have different numbers of treatments or numbers of samples within each treatment, uh, well, the critical value is just going to be calculated slightly differently. And we'll be doing this in R, and so it's not essential that you know uh, how to look these values up in the t-table. But uh, it is important to recognize that if you have differences in the number of samples within treatments, the F-test will be calculated a little bit differently. And remember that F-test, the F-test is a uh, always test the upper tail value. And so the F-distribution goes from zero to infinity. And so we don't have any negative values like we might with the T-test or a Z-test. And so here's an example of the iron content data and an analysis of variance table. And this is output directly from R. So what we can see here uh, is that the variation between groups, or the sums of squares between groups, is labeled by the name of the grouping factor. Now in the iron data, this is called depth.fact. And so here is a sum of squares between groups, the mean square between groups, and then we can think about the variation within groups, or the within group sum of squares is labeled residuals. And so we can see the sums of squares for that value here. And so this is important to know. And what we can look at now is we could calculate the F value. And already you should see that 35.107 is a pretty large value. And so we're probably going to end up rejecting the null hypothesis. And what do you know when we look at the P value, Remember, if we were to do this test at something like 0 0.05, which is a common level of significance, well, this p-value is 9.248 times 10 to the negative 7th. So it is an incredibly small p-value. And so in this case, we would reject the null hypothesis, and we would conclude that at least one water depth in the iron level data set is different from at least one other water depth. And so that's important to know, and that's some insight uh, into our analysis. So like we said, given our analysis, we would reject the null hypothesis, and we would conclude that at least one mean at a certain water depth is different from another. If we were to look that in R, we would look up the critical value at a level of significance of 0.05 with 5 and 12 degrees of freedom. Remember, 5 is the number of treatments minus 1. 12 is the number of observations minus the number of treatments minus 1. That would be 3.1. And so remember from the R output, we got a value of 35.107. So that is far and away much greater than 3.1, which would indicate we reject the null hypothesis. So a visualization to see what that ANOVA looks like. So just like we did with simple linear regression, we can use model diagnostics to check the assumptions of what we're doing. So in this graph, are we seeing the ideal shotgun pattern in this residual graph? Well, it's a little tricky because the iron data are grouped at different water levels. You might remember if you look back at that box plot, we had a lot of at those really low water levels like 0, 10, and 20 feet. We didn't see a lot of variability. But then we saw the 40 and 50 feet grouped, and then we saw the 100 feet grouped. And I think that's exactly what you're seeing here. We don't really see a, a shotgun pattern because we have the data clustered uh, just based on the kind of information that we found and the iron content levels in those data.
So here's another one. Here's the QQ plot or the quantile quantile plot. Uh, so we often use this to test normality. So can we say that the data are normally distributed? Well, uh, it would be difficult. What I would think about doing if I were to do another analysis on these data is to think about a transformation. And I say that because we have values here at the extremes of the data uh, that seem to be influential. Uh, and so we might think about transforming the data, maybe in doing a second analysis uh, to meet uh, and to kind of test some of those assumptions uh, of normality. And so this kind of concludes the analysis of variance. And so what we concluded was that the null hypothesis is rejected, uh, but you should be left wondering more. Uh, that is to say, well, we found out that at least one of them is different from the other one, but we don't know which ones. Uh, and so this is really where the concept of multiple comparisons comes in. And so multiple comparisons are kind of done after we do an analysis of variance, and multiple comparisons will allow us to compare specific means. And so is the iron level data collected at 100 feet significantly different from the iron level data collected at zero feet? That's what multiple comparisons are going to allow us to do. The analysis of variance is a first step to allowing us to say which specific means are different in our data.